Well, good morning, church. Good to see all of you. Good to be home. Um, and this is home for us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I, I don't know what, what you said. Did you say anything about me at all? Yeah. Oh, you did? Okay. All right. I don't know what you said. Oh, okay. Well, um, in one way or another, I, I uh, was around this place one role or another for 27 years, and um, last time I was behind this sacred space, it was uh, five years ago, so it's just good to be back and good to share with you. For those of you who don't, uh, uh, or who don't know me, you might be interested in our family and what's happened. Um, I had one lady after the early service said, I can't believe that it's been 24 years that since Tim, well, it's not quite 24, but 24 years. He's 24 now and um, works for, in the um, healthcare uh, business, works from home, has his own apartment. Mom and dad are very grateful for that. And um, Abby, Amy's uh, youngest, is a senior at Mount Union College, or University of Mount Union. Ma uh, Ma uh, not Matthews. Um, Scott's four kids. Uh, two of them are now in college at Mount Union, um, Matthew and Anna. Matthew's a senior and Anna's just starting as a freshman. Then the two youngest girls, the, uh, Kara is uh, a freshman in high school. And uh, uh, Natalie, our youngest, is going to turn 12 on Saturday. And uh, it's hard to believe that they're almost all, all grown. And, and, um, but they're, they still like to have Pop-Pop and Grandma around. And we're about equidistant between the two of them. And uh, still married to my bride of 57 years and loving on her as much as I can. And uh, you, can, you continue to pray for us as uh, we journey into this, uh, what's called the senior years. I used to think that, you know, when you got to 80, you were old. I've reevaluated that as I approach that magical number. And, uh, you know, if you're 90, you're old now. So um, at any rate, I'm, I'm just grateful for this privilege. Thanks, Pastor Chris, for the opportunity. And, um, uh, we're so grateful to be here today and uh, share with you. Uh, let's pause for a word of prayer. Father, I, I pray that you would first speak to me, and then that you would speak through me to my brothers and sisters who are gathered here on this day. Open our hearts and lives and fill them with love for your son, Jesus, for we pray in his name. Amen. I'm going to begin with a couple of questions. Have you ever received an invitation to a party you really didn't want to go. Um, what'd you do about that? Or have you ever invited people to your party and uh, you planned, but half of them didn't show up? You cleaned, you cooked, you decorated, everything was ready. As we begin, that's kind of central to the passage we're going to look at today as we continue the series in Matthew's gospel. And as we begin, I want you to understand that this particular parable that Jesus told is an allegory. Now, an allegory is a symbolic story that uh, conveys a secondary meaning. So it's important that you keep in mind that in this story, the king is God, the son is Jesus, the invited guests are the children of Israel, and the people from the highways and the streets, those are Gentiles. Now, for further background, just let me share that Jesus has entered Jerusalem now, by this time, for the very last time. And we are chapters away from the Last Supper, betrayal, trial, and crucifixion. At this moment, the tension is ramping up between Jesus and the religious leaders over the source and the nature of his authority. So, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 22. We're starting at verse 2 this morning. And we're going to unpack it a little bit because Jesus tells a story that has to do with clothing and so much more. It's a story that doesn't have a happy ending, but it's a story with several important lessons we're going to look at this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can read along with me or see it on the screen. We're starting at verse 2. Jesus speaking, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. 
Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. Now, the chief priests and the elders were all familiar with wedding feasts in general. The wedding banquet was one of the most joyous occasions in Jewish life, and it could last for up to a week. It would last a week long. Now, um, parents, imagine having to pay for a week-long wedding and reception for your youngsters. I would have pleaded bankruptcy before I started. At any rate, the banquet was, was uh, as I said, and it, it was an expensive experience. It required a lot of time. And royal weddings were major community events. And the feasts that celebrated them were among the largest um, banquets that would ever occur in a king's reign. So no expenses were to be spared. Everybody who was anybody of note in the kingdom would be invited and honored to be invited to the wedding feast of the king's son. Now Jesus was picturing here the most elaborate celebration possible, the ultimate party. If if it took place in western Pennsylvania, it would no doubt have been held maybe at Mansion on 5th or Nemecolon or Bedford Springs. But anything that's happening there this weekend would be nothing by comparison. Now, in that time of place, and even today in some cases, uh, there was a two-stage process to be invited to a wedding. The invitation was actually sent out well in advance, and everybody sent back their RSVP. And then those who had said yes got a courtesy reminder later on, maybe even the day of the banquet itself. So the king sent out his invitations, and they didn't respond, and then he sent again. Send out others. And he said, look, it's going to be a great party. There's lots of food. We're going to have fun. But they said, oh, I'm sorry. We've got other things to do. I just can't make it. We'd love to, but we're just too busy. You know how it is, King. We've all had that happen to us at some time or another. You work hard. You're excited about what you've got planned. The big day comes. You plan for 20 and three show up. You planned for 30, and you get eight. You want to cry. It makes you depressed and angry and frustrated. And if you know how the king in this, fair, in this parable felt, then in some small way, you know how God feels whenever one of us rejects his invitation to be part of his kingdom that he's prepared for us. But it gets even worse. Verse 6. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I have invited did not deserve, note that word, to come. Now, I'm sure the Jews listening to Jesus would have thought, well, who would do such a king? Nobody would refuse to go to the king's banquet, and yet some of these people refused to attend. They were, at best, indifferent. Some of them got downright violent with the messengers, further showing contempt for the king. So the king is furious. He punishes these rebellious people and tells his servants, go out and round up all the folks you can. Verse 9. So go into the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. The king says, the food is ready, the drinks is ready, we're going to have a, ready, we're going to have a party, so go out and anybody who wants to come is welcome to come to the feast, the bad and the good. The banquet hall was filled with people. Now remember, for three years, Jesus has been teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, proclaiming himself to be the Messiah, the Son of God. His message was primarily to the people of Israel the chosen people of God. When the Jews rejected the kingdom, the invitation was then extended to anyone and everyone who wanted to come. In Acts 13, 46, Paul and Barnabas are talking to the Jews of Antioch. And they they tell us about this. They say, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Now, since you've rejected it, 
and don't consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we are going to turn to the Gentiles. And that's exactly what they did. Now, we're not there yet, but notice that when we get there, by the end of the parable, there's no one who is not invited to the king's wedding feast. And that's one of the points of the parable. When God throws a party, it's the biggest bash in town, and there isn't a single person who is left off the invitation list. When when Jesus died on the cross, listen now, when Jesus died on the cross and was made sin for us, no one was left out. He died for all. So it's easy to understand the parable to this point, but then there is this incident, the wedding guest without a garment, verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guest, he had noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are invited, but few are chosen. The radicalness of the invitation comes to a screeching halt. The king came, uh, you can, if you can imagine this, um, and I suspect most fathers of the bride do this. The king was out greeting his guests. He was going from table to table, saying good morning, good afternoon, whatever it might have been, shaking people's hands, welcoming them, making the rounds of the guests that had accepted the invitation. And they came from all over the kingdom. And then he spotted someone without a wedding garment, and he was furious. Notice the king calls him friend. Did you pick that up? In a seminar in Matthew's Gospel, Emory professor is preaching, Tom Long, points out, I love this, that in Matthew, it's never a good thing to be called friend. You can go home and check that one out. But there's a point to it. You see, the king knew this guy. He knew him. Notice as well in that passage the word speechless. The, man, the man's uh, reaction indicates that he knew he was wrong for coming improperly dressed. He knew better. Wearing, and it's true today, isn't it? Wearing the right clothing to a formal dinner honors the guest and the occasion. And neglecting to wear it is somewhat of an insult. Getting cleaned up and dressed was a way of showing appreciation and respect for the invitation. Now, remember, they had, ra- they had gathered up and, and rounded up from every part of the land. People had been taken off the streets. And even if they had time to dress properly, they maybe didn't have the clothes that were appropriate for such an occasion. So it makes me wonder, is that such a big deal? Well, commentators tell us in that day and at that time, the king himself supplied garments for the wedding and the reception. All the guests had to do was just put it on. But here was a man who didn't even make the small effort involved in putting on the proper clothing. Now, at first glance, to you and me, it may seem a small thing, but it's not. Here's the reason. This guy thought he could come to the king's feast on his own terms. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Forget about what the king wanted or what the king had provided for the occasion. I'll do it my way. Isn't that the case with some people in the kingdom of God? A lot of people want to be part of the feast, but they don't want to submit themselves to God's terms. So, That's the parable. Are there lessons for us today? I think there are. Let me point out three. But let me say to begin that the parable of the wedding feast was originally intended for the Jews, especially Jewish leaders. Now remember, it's an allegory. God chose the people of Israel, but time and time again they rejected God's prophets and refused his invitation, God's commandments. And then God sent Jesus, and again... The people of Israel, by and large, refused to believe he was the Messiah. So the invitation was then given to anyone, the bad and the good, those who knew God's law and those who didn't, both Jew and Gentile. 
Now, since we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, this story, story uh, kind of makes you want to uh, smile, shake the hand of the people around you, and, and think we're not uh, like those bad old Jews who didn't accept Jesus. We believe. We're in. Except. Except. Now, let me point out that we should not interpret this parable as meaning God has excluded Israel. Paul makes that point when he asks in Romans 11, 1, did God reject his people? And then he answers, by no means. Paul says of the Jewish people, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and the recalling of God are irrevocable. Yet, we have this nagging feeling that this story has a message that's somehow deeper than just the difference between those who believe in Jesus and those who don't. In fact, the more you study this story, the story says something about the difference between believing in Jesus and following Jesus. I get this sense that this is somehow about the difference between accepting Jesus as Savior and serving Jesus as Lord about going to church and being the church. So what lessons can we draw from all of this? Well, first of all, our response to God's invitation is crucial. It's a dangerous thing to make light of God's invitation, but all of them, each in their own way, according to verse 5, made light of it. The Greek word used here means to neglect or be, be unconcerned about someone or something. The invitation just wasn't that important to any of those people who were invited. It had no priority for them. Reminds me of folks who just don't seem to have any interest in spiritual things. Now, they're not antagonistic toward the things of God. They just have no time for them. Even those of us who are Christians need to examine our lives to look close and see if, if we know... Uh, that we're responding to God's invitation on a daily basis. If the desire to do everything we can to serve him is there, or has our initial enthusiasm when we first became Christian, and we are excited about living for Jesus, has that somehow over the years grown dim? When Paul and Barnabas said to the Jews what they said in Acts 13, I spoke about a minute ago, it's important to understand their unworthiness had nothing to do with their inherent qualities or lack of them. The Gentiles weren't morally, a morally better people. It was the Jews' stubborn attitude and their refusal to obey that designated them as unworthy. It makes us wonder, are we in the first group, the invited guests, or... Are we in the second group? Are we unworthy or are we worthy? What separates the first group from the second? The difference isn't that one is more deserving than the other. The difference isn't that the king likes one group more than the other. The difference isn't that some guests are good and some are bad. The only thing, listen now, the only thing that distinguishes the first invited guest from the second guest is presence presence the second guests showed up the key is to be present and to be present frankly friends is is difficult work it means putting priority on the other person it means seeing them for who they are not who we want them to be or think they should be it means opening ourselves to receive their life into ours it means vulnerability it means really listening to what they say and not just what we want to hear it means letting go of our own agendas our own fears and our own prejudices it means offering all we have and all we are and if we're not doing that with others we're probably not doing it with god we're too busy, too tired, too distracted. There's work to be done and money to be made. And if we don't earn it or work for it, we assume it has no value. Listen to me now. What we do, what we do as people of faith matters. What we do as people of faith matters. It's, it's easy, isn't it? It's easy 
It's easy for me to compartmentalize my life. It's easy for you to do the same thing, especially, particularly, our faith life. This parable insists our faith ought to make a difference in how we live. It's about obedience. Matthew affirms for us to be worthy of God's gift on the cross requires nothing less than our whole life. Paul puts it this way in Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. There's an expectation that a Jesus follower will make a difference. And it will be obvious in the way we live our lives. Especially to those around us. What makes a, a person worthy of Jesus today is a willingness to commit our lives to God, to take him at his word and obey him. Whether or not God judges you as worthy of his kingdom is determined by your response to him. It's not just your initial response in becoming a Christian, but your continued response in being obedient as a follower of Jesus. Second lesson the invitation is to all. The king sends his servants out into the streets to invite everybody that they can find, both bad and good. The doors are thrown wide open. The invitation extends literally to all. The good, we understand. I mean, some had good honor, good amounts of wealth, good social manners, all the things we associate with being good. But what about the bad? The Greek here can mean two different kinds of bad. One is obvious. It often means evil or wicked. But it can also be used to describe something physical or being deficient in some way. We might think of it as flawed. The poor, the unknown, the outcast, strangers, the least likely of all people. A theme, by the way, Matthew has been hammering away at since his opening genealogy. The flawed Matthew repeatedly taught are especially dear to Jesus. You see, God calls even the riffraff, the known sinners, the blight to society, to his kingdom and his banquet. Invite, or invitation, is a key word as well in this parable. God's call is a standing call, meaning it's always there. It, it lasts no matter what we do, who we are, or what we have done. God is still calling. In Revelation 22, 17, when the final invitation in the Bible is extended, John hears the Spirit say, the Spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life come. Who can accept the invitation of God? Anybody who wants to. Anybody who wants to. People who have lived a moral, upright life since they were little children, as well as the dregs of society, the murderers, the rapists, the prostitutes of this world. Uh, everyone is invited, both bad and good. You ready? That's what's known as grace. That's what's known as grace. Grace calls you wherever you may be to something better. That leads us to the third lesson I think this parable teaches that grace doesn't eliminate standards. The late biblical scholar R.T. France puts it this way. He says, The symbolism is of someone who preserves or presumes on the free offer of salvation, but assuming that therefore there are no obligations attached. Someone whose life belies their profession. Faith without works. Here's a key phrase. Entry to the kingdom of heaven may be free, but it continues but to continue in it, I'm sorry, let me start again. Entry to the kingdom of heaven may be free, but to continue in it carries conditions. We all love grace. <laughs> we preachers, we preach grace a lot. That's the gospel. Jesus exuded grace. There's no question about that. Far from being afraid of him, sinners and those who, sh who were shunned by the religious establishment of the day found Jesus attractive and welcoming. That's grace. That's grace for you. 
What Jesus came to offer the world was the most precious thing God could offer, a divine sacrifice of such gargantuan dimensions, we will just never be able to fully comprehend a love so great. But precisely because of the value and the beauty and the majesty of all of that, to have it rejected, to have it spurned, chalk it up to being of no account is not a small matter. The fact that we enter the kingdom of, uh, by grace doesn't mean there are no standards. Remember the guy with no wedding suit? This guy hadn't made an effort to prepare himself for the feast. And in doing so, listen carefully, he showed a half-hearted attitude. But my friends, following Jesus is always something costly and all-embracing. You can't go on acting like you're not at an extraordinary party, even now. It means a diligent effort to live up to kingdom standards. Spiritual sloppiness will not be acceptable at the banquet of the King of Kings. If you take nothing with you this morning from what I've said, take this last, not last. You should know me better than that. Take this with you. Grace is not just a gift. Grace is a responsibility. Grace is not just a gift. It's a responsibility. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to make him your first priority, to offer him your time, talents, gifts, and service, not what's left over after everything else is done and the bills are paid. One of the things I love about our church is that we're a generous church. You look around this building, it's, it's God did a marvelous thing, a, an unbelievable thing to put this building in place through the generosity of his people. people. I know people who gave hundreds of thousands of dollars for this building, and some who gave 50 and 60, and some who gave 10, and some who gave $10. And each gift made this place possible, no matter what size it was. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to be immersed in the teachings of Jesus and filled with his spirit. We've got to be committed to getting our life in line with what God wants us to be. The point is, our relationship with God depends on what God has done for us. Grace. But we're called to a life that lives out that grace daily. The parable, interestingly enough, ends with these words. Many are called, but few are chosen. That's another way of saying everybody is invited but very few wind up at the table. I'm going over. I haven't worn a watch since I retired. Stick with me. Very few wind up at the table. Why? It certainly isn't God's fault. A real-life king would not try to persuade people to attend his banquet. He's not going to force anybody to eat and drink from his table. Everyone has the opportunity to enter the kingdom of God, but only a relative few will accept the invitation and be serious enough to clothe themselves in God's gift of the cross. Let me tell you something. When the religions of this world are stripped down to their very basic tenets, we either find humanity working its way up to God, or we find the cross of Jesus Christ. The good news is God gives us a free gift. The catch is we have to be willing to accept it. And I believe, friends, God is calling us right now, in this moment, in this time, in our time, more than ever before, to put on Christ and witness to his grace and love in the world around us. Let me close with a story. In 1904, young William Borden graduated from high school in Chicago. As heir to the Borden Dairy fortune, he was already a multimillionaire. As a graduation present, his parents gave the 16-year-old a trip around the world. As he traveled through Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, he sensed a burden to reach lost nations, the lost people in the nations that were cut off from the gospel. Finally, he wrote to his parents, he said, I'm going to give my life to prepare for the mission field. One of his friends was completely shocked by this. 
letting Bar- Borden know that it, he felt he was throwing his life away as a missionary. When Borden heard that, he went to his room, picked up his Bible, opened it to the front cover, inside the cover, and wrote two words, no reserve. Even though Borden was fabulously wealthy, he arrived at Yale University in 1905 attempting to appear like any other freshman. But soon his classmates noticed something that was quite unique about him. One of them wrote, he came to college far ahead spiritually. He had already given his heart in full surrender to Christ. He learned to lean on him and find in him a strength that was solid as a rock just because of this settled purpose and consecration. During his first year at at Yale, He challenged a friend to pray with him before breakfast every day. And soon a second joined them, and then a third, and a fourth, and then others. And by the end of his first year, 150 freshmen were meeting every day for prayer and Bible study in small groups. By the time Borden was a senior, 1,000 of Yale's 1,300 student body were gathering in small groups every week for prayer and Bible study. His ministry extended beyond Yale as he sought to help widows and orphans and cripples and drunks in the area, forming the Yale Hope Mission. Borden felt a, they continued to feel this missionary call, especially to reach out to China. So once he graduated, he turned down several lucrative uh, career offers and went home and wrote two more words in the front of his Bible. No retreat. He went on instead to complete a master's degree at Princeton Seminary, and in 1913, the entire country was fascinated as this wealthy and gifted young man turned his back on affluence and comfort in America to risk everything to go to China. On his way there, he first stopped in Cairo, Egypt to study Arabic because he was going to be reaching, trying to reach Muslims. And while there, he contracted spinal meningitis and died a few weeks later in a hospital room all alone. Borden not only gave away his wealth, but himself in a way way so joyous and natural that it seemed a privilege rather than a sacrifice, wrote his biographer. He could have had everything, but instead he met an untimely death at age 25. As his associates and his friends were packing up his belongings, preparing to send them to his parents, they found his Bible right next to his hospital bed. And in the front cover, under the knee, the words, no reserve and no retreat, the dying warden had scrawled two final words, no regrets. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, because I want to speak very personally to each one of you this morning. Maybe God is speaking to you, asking a couple questions. Are you ready or are you living a life that is marked by no reserve? You're holding back nothing to serve Jesus. Are you living a life of no retreat, resolved to never go back to the life you lived without him, living every day looking to share his grace and peace with others? And when you get to the end of your life here on earth, will you look back and be blessed to say that you have no regrets for the privilege of knowing Jesus? You've given him everything you possibly could. Let me tell you the good news. The invitation to the banquet still stands. Whether or not you come to the feast depends on you. If you take the kingdom of God lightly, you will never enter. But if you give the kingdom's invitation the priority it deserves being willing to believe and obey, then you will enjoy the blessings of that kingdom now and throughout eternity. And maybe you're here this morning and for the first time, maybe God has touched you on the shoulder and said, now is the time. It's either now or maybe never. If you're here and you want that relationship with Jesus, I just ask you to silently pray these words with me. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for the things that I've done in my life that weren't always up to my own standards, let alone yours. I repent of them. I'm sorry for them. And I'm asking you to come into my life to be not just my Savior, but the Lord of my life, to to direct my life from this day forward. Thank you for that promise. Thank you, Lord, that we can live a life of no 
retreat and no reserve and no regrets. And that your promise to us as an eternity with you. For we ask and pray in your name. Amen.